pretty much compulsory for a conference theme to be dramatic, energizing, dynamic. And the MWC here in Barcelona is certainly no exception to that rule. Velocity, unleashing tomorrow's technology today. But away from the all-round sense of liberating and speed, what does unleashing tomorrow's technology actually mean? What have we most got to look forward to? It's a pretty obvious question for Transform Talks to put to the economist, author, and co-founder of the Discovery Institute, George Gilder. Well, ultimately, a metaverse, a meta world, is, requires ubiquitous wireless capabilities. And that's the heart of World Mobile Congress, is opening up um, more frequencies, more paths, lower latency, all the prerequisites of a metaverse. Uh, where we all can communicate both as ourselves and in virtual duplicates of our environment. And one of the things about connectivity and increased connectivity we've heard a lot about is 5.5G, the next iteration, the next stage of connectivity. Um, do you think that will bring a huge change? Do you think people understand the level of change it could bring? I, th I think that that uh, the key thing is that uh, is really the move toward what I call 6G based on graphene and pioneered by Huawei. That's the real future because graphene, which is a single hexagonal web of carbon atoms, that is 200 times stronger than steel, more conductive than copper, uh, more thermally, gets rid of heat better than any other substance ever known to science. All these features of graphene can transform uh, the mobile economy. And I, I, today, uh, Huawei is working on graphene, but there's virtually no mention of it across the floors of this Congress. But I predict that 6G is going to be a graphene era. And what will, it, what will that enable? What will 6G or 5.5G and then 6G enable for people? 6G will really make uh, 3D uh, uh, communication ubiquitous, you know, that 3D, 4G in, in space and time will be integrated across a global economy of connectivity. And I hope Amity, uh, one of the great things about the World Mobile Congress is the world. And uh, all these technologies require contributions from people all around the world and bring the world together. And that's what I uh, hope for from these adventures in technology. And how do we stop businesses being left behind, a kind of digital gap, as, as certain businesses embrace and modernize? I others? don't believe in the digital gap. The fact is that when technologies don't work very well, all the rich people buy them and use them. And then as they get cheap and ubiquitous, then everybody gets them. And uh, the third world is, in fact, ahead of the first world in some forms of digital finance. You know, M-Pesa mm -hmm. in uh, Africa is really better than PayPal in the United States. It's, uh, it's completely uh, transparent on your cell phone. And so I, I think that the miracle of all these technologies is they get fabulously cheaper and better as they get cheaper and more available to more people. So all this talk about the digital gap really mostly comes from politicians and uh, who don't really understand the promise of the technology. And if they try to force technologies that don't quite work on the third world, uh, it'll fail. The, the, it'll be ineffective and, and it'll slow down the pro miraculous process of advance that's so underway. Chat GPT is another big topic of yeah, conversation. Yeah. It's got an immediate reaction, a mix of hope and horror. Yeah. Which camp do you fall in? I, I think it's another step 
in uh, computer technology. It's not a mind. Uh, the idea that it's going to usurp us makes me very worried about the intellectual processes of great men like Elon Musk, who fears uh, AI. I think AI has, it's governed by Gödel's proof. And Kurt Gödel, fa famous foundation of information theory, is that no logical system is complete. It's always dependent on propositions outside it that cannot be proven within it. In other words, every system that computer scientists create is necessarily dependent on human minds outside the system. And nothing about chat GPT changes the situation. It's uh, what's dangerous about chat GPT is that people are kind of worshipping it as if it's a voice from above and uh, so you're saying calm down a bit. It's, just, it's, just calm down. it's another computer tool Fine. and it'll be very helpful and it will advance productivity around the world we're talking of advancing productivity and we touched a bit on digital finance you said about M-Pesa in Africa Five years from now, what do you predict the state of digital finance will be for businesses and customers? Well, I think the existing financial system around the world is in jeopardy, that uh, we're going to find blockchain-based uh, technologies. A blockchain is an immutable network where all the transactions occur in every node. And this is made possible by a two billion fold increase in the density of computer memories. Think of that, two billion fold in 50 years, mm -hmm. and it's going to continue. And, and this uh, makes possible a real secure distributed financial system, more like M-Pesa than like Chase Manhattan. And do you welcome that? Is that a good, is that a sort of democratization? Yes, of? I think so. It's, uh, it's a real, uh, it's a distributed financial system. Mm -hmm. and, and the banks are going to have, you know, all the banks have been nationalized around the world. They're all instruments of their central banks. And this is alien to the history of money. Mm -hmm. uh, the real money was gold and, in the past and gold standard based economies actually led the world. Uh, Britain led the world in the Industrial Revolution through the superiority of its financial system based on gold as Isaac Newton established it. Isaac Newton proved as master of the mint that gold could not be synthesized from lead or inferior material. So it was the ultimate financial tool. But gold is hard to chop up and, and distribute and, so and this is the new gold render gold. currency. So yeah. we're going to have digital gold based on blockchains. Mm -hmm. And it's going to, I think, establish a, a new financial system. So what about the role of a private company like Huawei and other companies such as Huawei in this digital finance world? What, what service will we be providing? Well, I, th I think uh, companies like Huawei will create the technology that enable mm. th uh, this transformation of global money and the acceleration of global progress. Velocity. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Uh, Huawei is really learning how to achieve velocity these days. It's, it's being attacked all around the world and it's... Uh, We're adapting. And, and, and it's, yeah. it's adapting by focusing on graphene is one of the things it's doing. And this mm -hmm. is a thrilling new path to the future. And do, you, do you think that digital finance obviously relies on digital networks? and not everyone can have access to digital networks. Do you think both that network access and digital finance is becoming almost like a new fundamental right 
that people should have. I certainly do. I mean, I, I, I think you, you say everybody can't have access to digital networks. Of course everybody can have access to digital networks, essentially. Already it's possible. There may be some reaches of the Antarctica that are chiefly accessible only by iridium or low Earth orbit satellites of some sort, but, but essentially, essentially yeah. digital networks can be ubiquitous. Yes. So it's a case of making sure that they yeah. are ubiquitous yeah. rather than theoretical. Yeah. So we've talked about 5.5G, digital finance, transforming the world. Why then with that sort of excitement and technological potential, why is there still a shortage of tech talent? I think that there's been massive intervention around the world uh, that is trying to control technology. The, the European Union is afraid of Google and Facebook. Uh, the US is paralyzed by TikTok and Huawei. Uh, there's a lot of gratuitous and unuseful intervention and regulation of technology that's actually retarding progress these days. And, but I think, uh, I think we're going to break out of this, uh, that this is a bad phase we're in at the moment. But does that impact talent? Does that impact the numbers? Well, it, it, it makes, makes uh, uh, fewer opportunities. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, uh, I think the world has to learn to stop solving problems and pursue opportunities. That's my introduction to the Huawei finance book I did a few years ago. It begins with that quotation from Peter Drucker. Right. Don't solve problems. When you solve problems, you end up feeding your failures, starving your strengths, and achieving costly mediocrity. Pursue opportunities. That's very and inspiring. The opportunities of a superabundant world economy. And there's no material limitations to the human, human progress. They're all... Uh, sort of constraints in the mind. Uh, yeah. But what, and so again, Huawei's role or a company, a private company's role in directing that talent or investing in that talent? Do they yes, have a role? That certainly does. Mm. I mean, it, these private companies are diverse. You know, people are exalting diversity. Mm. Well, private companies are a force for diversity around the globe. And uh, Huawei has 30% of Huawei's people are, are not Chinese. And uh, they got offices, I think, 170 countries. They're a global force of emancipation for a new technology. And that's what impressed me from the beginning. And uh, Ren Zhenfei, who I met and interviewed several times the in Shenzhen in China, yeah. has, says that the reason the U.S. has succeeded is its openness. And when it is less open, it becomes less successful. And Huawei's success is dependent on its openness to the world. And that is, and I sincerely pray that both American openness and Huawei openness can uh, ultimately prevail over our well, it, dismal science of scarcity and decline and, and various panicky fears for the future. Well, it's, it's striking you talk about open to the world, the founder of Huawei, Ren Zhengfei's quotation yeah. about being open to the world. Here am I, an Englishman, interviewing you, an American, in a Spanish city for a Chinese company. Yeah. Does it sort of give you cause for hope? It that does, it does. I, it's exciting to be in <laughs> Barcelona for the Mobile World Congress, or however they <laughs> I think say I must, it these days. Well, I must finish with it. I mean, it's pretty obvious what the answer to this will be, but ultimately, you're in your 80s, you've seen huge changes and transformations. Do you remain fundamentally optimistic about the future? I've remained completely optimistic about the future. As long as we 
liberate individual human beings. And so the real promise in the world is unleashing uh, talent. And uh, Huawei has been shown tremendous success in mobilizing talent in China and around the world. And this shouldn't be regarded to be a threat. This is wonderful. This is what, what Americans should want. And uh, so this is uh, why I'm happy to be here and at the World Mobile Congress so it's and being interviewed at this event. So it's unleash the human brain, unleash yeah. opportunity. George, yeah. thanks very much. Thank you.